those things, or if they really, really kind of inspired me when, um, when I heard um, Howard Bihar, Bihar yesterday, he spoke about the six Ps, and one of the things that he talked about was performance. And, um, and the one thing that he said is that people hate performance evaluations. Who loves performance evaluations? All right, okay, who hates performance evaluations? All right, how many of you are um, managers? Everybody, almost. How many of you are not managing s staff? Okay, how do you feel about performance evaluations? <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Is that your boss? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I am. I've got this metaphor of of glue here, and uh, I've I've used that a, a couple of different times, but I think it applies a lot here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why this is a passionate topic of mine, um, and. You think about how it integrates with the Drive Conference. It's not technology, it's not visual exchange so much, but it very much is data and it's um, tracking data consistently. And um, when I think about all of the other functions that I do that are the biggest part of my job, um, there's this tiny slice of performance evaluations and managing my team that's critical to the work that all of us do. And I don't wanna leave that out. Um, and then I'll talk about what it is I did and what the methodology is that I came to. And then if you're interested, how you could do something similar. Um, one disclosure is uh, this is not a Holy Cross implemented, Holy Cross wide implemented approach. Um, I am a rogue manager that didn't care so much for their approach. Um, at, it's a little, a little ironic, I think it's ironic. Um, but after I started doing this, I've done this for three years now, and after I started doing it, the Human Resources Department did take a look at um, their evaluation system, and now they're um, integrating a PMS, which I thought was great, um, performance management system. Um, I, I think, well, I'll leave that there. So the, here's my disclosure anyway. Um, so clearly, not a lot of people enjoy performance evaluations. Um, I don't mind them anymore. Um, I started, uh, I, I, this reference to glue, I just had a couple of pointers here. Um, I use glue as a metaphor for my staff. I feel like my staff really holds everything together and um, if it weren't for them, my, I don't know what I would do. You know, I've, I've got great staff. Uh, you know, I mean, everybody has some great people and some that could use a little help I don't have a whole lot that could use a little help. Um, and, and so I'm fortunate in that way. But um, the glue, that's them. You know, they bind us together. And as long as I invest in them and take care of them, um, things seem to go pretty well. But uh, they're taking care of me. They, they hold me together. When I think I'm gonna lose it, I've got, um, I was saying yesterday at dinner, I have a little hypoglycemia. So I have a staff person that will walk by and say, hmm, here's a cookie. You know, thank you, thanks. Uh, she keeps me together. Um, so I don't wanna be this guy here. I don't know if everybody can read that okay. It says, I don't have time to write performance reviews, so I'll just criticize you in public from time to time. Um, but y you could. It's effective if you want to stop some behavior, but you stop a lot of behavior that way, and, and then your staff spends a little time talking about you behind your back, which is really productive. Um, but my staff is great. I, can't say that enough, they're super glue. They're not just your average glue. Um, they help protect the people that we um, develop, develop solutions for. Um, I also, they keep us feeling invincible. You know, they, um, they're, they're very inspiring. Um, so here's, this is an image of my, um, one of my direct reports. Um, uh, but what I wanted to figure out was how to reinforce all the things that they do really well and how to identify those opportunities they have for improvement. But the, um, th there's a big deal to me about what's important to me as a manager. So what's important to me and what's important to all of you is probably, th there's some overlap there, but there are things that I think that my staff has to do well in order to do their job the best that they can. So, um, and, and that might be different from your ideas. So how do they know what's important to me if I don't tell them? That's, that's a big point. Um, and um, 
the bottom line is that my staff, they're worth it. They're worth the time it takes to do a performance evaluation well. Um, we have two kinds of work that we do in my office. Um, we have special operations and standard operations. Um, our special ops would be a, any project that has a defined start and end. You can put together a project plan. You can measure progress to goal. Um, our standard operations is the day-to-day. -day. Some of it's measurable. Some of it's not so much because it's all there's a lot of ad hoc procedures going on. And um, the nice thing about special ops is it account the that's the 20% of the work that we do. Sorry, and then the standard operations is about 80% of the work. And for the 20%, um, it's smart goal friendly. Who, you, does everybody know what a smart goal is? Here, I put a little reference down there. Um, I'm, I'm inundated with the whole smart goal approach. I don't know if any show of hands for people who are smart goal people. OK. That's a good number of you here. Um, so smart, smart goals are specific. They're measurable. They're attainable. They're relevant. And they're time-based. And um, if you can define a smart goal, you can measure your progress to su success pretty easily. Um, when for our operation, our standard operations, it, it's smart goal adverse. So it doesn't really work for me. Um, so this is why the special operations, that works for the traditional performance evaluation. But I needed something different for our day-to-day -day operations. So here's what matters to me. Um, first of all, if you're going to give a performance evaluation, there shouldn't be anything that's a surprise. If somebody's going to walk into my office and we're going to talk about their performance for the year, it should be a sum of everything they've heard all year long. Um, if there's something that's new, I'm probably not doing my job very well. So it's something that um, anything new should have been within the last two weeks. That's the way I see it. Um, we set goals and we measure the progress to those goals. But uh, for what we do, we keep the show on the road. And, um, and keeping that show going and improving the show is part of is one of my goals, and you can't really measure that. Just it, always improving is part of our um, approach. But I like to be fair, um, I like to be accurate, and I like to be relevant to the previous year. So if last year somebody came short on something, and this year they are um, measuring as I would expect them, that's an improvement. Um, if I don't have that relativity to the previous year, I don't know that they've improved from being subpar to par. Um, so I want to be able to capitalize on, on their improvement from under to meeting expectations. Um, and I like to work with my staff. And I like to work with my boss. I think that um, having that um, director and um, subordinate kind of, I don't like the word subordinate, but the direct report relationship, I think it's a two-way street. Um, so I don't want to be this guy. How come you never bring me any of your stupid ideas anymore? Um, so part of the way I avoid that is this approach. So I, um, part of it starts with a self-evaluation. Um, our staff will evaluate themselves. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And that gets incorporated into my evaluation of them. Um, I did have an evaluation. Uh, one time, it was a self-evaluation, and I filled it out, and I signed it, and I gave it to my boss, and he signed it, and then we gave it to HR. And that was my evaluation. It was great. I, didn't, I just wish I had known, because I would have been a lot more positive, a little less constructive, if I'd known that that was where it was going. Um, uh, so then I, I do my evaluation. So I do uh, evaluation on our goals and the progress to goal, and also um, a competency evaluation. And then I'll take their self-evaluation results and apply it to my evaluation. And, and the trick to that is I'm not allowed to even read their self-evaluation until I'm done. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but then at, in the end, we have a, a candid discussion of the work um, that they do and also the ways that I, as a manager, can help them. And that's, um, that's a little bit that's, that's a little difficult because I, I do ask them, OK, what am I doing? and how am I doing, and what can I do differently. And um, th that part isn't the easiest part for me, because it's opening the door up for criticism. Um, uh, but I think it's important. And I think if I don't have that part, then it doesn't round out the evaluation process for me. Um, 
So the self-evaluation actually serves a, a couple of different purposes. Um, it uh, will make sure that we're on the same page. And I have an, a couple of examples of self-evaluation questions that I use. Um, part of understanding if we're on the same page, you know, if someone thinks that they are doing great and I think they're doing terrible, we have to find a way to reconcile that. Um, I've always said that any conflict you can boil down to a mismatched set of expectations. So as long as you lay out the expectations, you're gonna be fine. Um, if you don't agree on the expectations, you might not be so fine. But as long as you know what's expected of you, you know how to win. Um, so that's part of uh, the self-evaluation. And it, the opportunity for two-way communication, the opportunity for them to articulate what it is that I can do better um, as their manager is, is critical. Um, let's see. So here's a self-evaluation sample that I have here. I think I can go through some of it. Um, I like... Uh, I like the second bullet here, um, reconciling differences in perspectives. Um, if I ask them to list their top three accomplishments of the year, and then I list their top three accomplishments of the year, and they're not the same, they're never the same, it's, it's fun for me because I think, okay, well, well, God, I forgot that they did that, and that was really a big deal. Um, in some cases, they think a project was a really big deal to them. And they've listed it as one of their top three accomplishments. And, and I th saw three different um, projects. So that gives me an opportunity to realize how important something was to them enough that it made their top three. And if I'm not referencing that in my evaluation, then I'm falling short in recognizing them and what they thought was so great. Um, so that's one of my favorite um, parts. Um, let's see. So. The, the rate your performance in the following areas, and I, I pick five to 10 competencies, and I sometimes pick the same competencies per person, um, or um, if I think that we're, we have a differing perspective on the rating for the individual, then I'll pick that competency so that we can see, okay, do we have the same sense of customer service? Do we have the same um, perspective on what their technical skills would be, or if I'm evaluating their management style, do we, do we both agree that they have um, the same level of skill set with regards to providing you know, um, constructive feedback or something like that? So I think that's fun because reconciling the, our differences and our perspectives is, a, is a, nice, um, a nice way to open up the lines of communication there. So here's a pie chart. Um, this is my visualization here. Um, I, I like pie charts because I, I like pie. So um, I break my evaluation up into three parts. The competency review is 70% of my evaluation. And I have a goal review, which is 25%. And then the 5%, it's a small piece, but it's the most important piece to me, um, which is this manager support opportunities. So. Um, that will come out of that self-evaluation, and that's the last thing that I talk about in their review. After we talk about them, we talk about me. Um, then we have this goal evaluation. And I have a couple of handouts, I think, that are going to come around. I don't, you probably haven't gotten them yet. Yes, okay. Um, thank you. So the goal evaluation is um, that SMART goal kind of approach. The, the things that we've identified as uh, the beginning and end project-oriented, project-based, um, measurable goals. And then um, this is how I break that up. And uh, any project that we have, we have a post-mortem process for. If we do the project well, then we go back over the project and talk about what went well and what didn't. So, Again, a lot of these things should have happened throughout the year. So none of this stuff should be a surprise to the person you're evaluating. Um, and then 5% of it, I do break this up into two groups. 5% of it should be establishing goals for the coming year. Okay. Um, so he, that 20% that and 5% add up to my quarter of the evaluation. Um, the part that really changed the way I did performance evaluations, and the reason that 
the um, standard performance evaluation where I worked didn't work is it was very open-ended and it would say, describe some accomplishments and tell me what you do well and tell me what you do poorly. And, um, and, and then there's always that, you know that scale when they say meets expectations is in the middle and then sometimes exceeds and constantly exceeds? I live in an environment where these three things, nobody really understands. They look at it as A, B, C, D, F. So if you have a staff person who's doing well, they should be here. But that's not the way it works, right? If you're constantly exceeding the expectations that your supervisor has for your work, you're not doing the right job. So this is where I want my staff to be, is floating somewhere between here and here, and eventually move them up. And when I'm moving them up, if they're consistently exceeds expectations, Maybe I should be looking at whether they should have my job. Um, so that's one of those things there. Um, but in this competency review, I'm handing out um, a list of the competencies that I identified for my staff. Um, the nice thing about it is that I'm able to measure all of these different areas and um, have it be on the same scale year to year. And the big key to this is that your staff should know what it is that is important to you and what it is that you're evaluating them on. So if I hire a new person now and I'm going to evaluate them in June, on their first week, I hand them a list of what's in front of you, which is the competencies that I use for my evaluation. And I say, this is what's important to me. And some of it's just very basic and you would think, well, duh, yeah, sure. All of these things are really important. But if I don't articulate that, then they don't know that they're going to get an attaboy for doing something that sounds pretty standard professional behavior, but it's important to the way that we do our work. Um, so I broke that up into seven groups. The product and business competencies, professional competencies, communication and participation, service orientation, and work quality. The last two of management and business analysis, not all of my staff manage other staff, so it doesn't apply to everybody, and not all of my staff is responsible for business analysis, so those two apply when they apply. Um, but we can pick out a couple of them. Um, for product and business competencies, we use a, a whole bunch of different products, and I need my staff to really know how to use it well, and not just use it well, but okay, if you know how we use it, also be aware of what's coming up and how we might explore the use of the application for different purposes and really maximize the use of the product. Um, so I, I look at that. Um, one thing to note is that if they're new to the job or they're new to the institution, I, I figure that in. If you're not meeting the expectations of the job because you're new, it's okay to sit here on, uh, as um, does not quite meet expectations. But I'm going to note that I, I would actually expect you to not ex meet the expectations, and it sounds kind of circular, but um, for professional competencies, um, being flexible, being steady under pressure, adapting to change. We talk about um, uh, being okay with ambiguity. This is, a, this is like a big thing in our department that you have to accept the fact that ambiguity is a, a, a place where we live on a daily basis. Um, that's something that's, 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 you have to pay attention to, I suppose. Um, but for me, communication and participation is important. And so I will, if, there, if somebody's done something well and, and you recognize it, I think you get a point for that. You're not a literal point, but I, I give you props. props. Um, service orientation. Uh, can you juggle competing priorities? How many things are, is, are coming in? I mean, we, um, I interviewed somebody recently and she had worked at the post office in seven different capacities. And I said to her, it sounds like the job that you have is a very linear job. So if she was, she worked, uh, she did some cleaning. So I said, you'd clean one thing at a time. And she said, yeah. And, and she worked the window. I said, okay. And so you'd see one customer at a time. And she said, yeah. And, and I said, okay. Uh, well, when you sorted mail, how many pieces of mail did you sort at a time? She said, what, one? And I said, okay, let me tell you a little bit about this job. I said, this job is like sitting in a rotating chair and somebody spins you and I'm just gonna fire stuff at you. And she looked at me and she kind of went white. 
And I said, um, how does that sound? And, and so she wasn't interested in the job after, after that. And, I, and it was good for me because it, it's, um, I always think of hiring as being um, like matchmaking. You know, we've got this great job and we need a great person. And if the, it's the wrong person for the job or it's the wrong person for your organization and it's the wrong, I, I can teach skill set, but she wasn't going to, it wasn't going to work for her and, and she knew it and I knew it. So um, being able to prioritize when you have 8,000 different things coming at you and we, you feel like you might throw up because you're spinning so fast, um, that's something. Um, I, don't, I don't think I actually wrote it as a competency, but when I interview people, I ask them what their mind reading skills are. And, and the, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but not really. I mean, when you think about it, that's a lot of what we do all the time is assessing the business needs of our colleagues and then trying to get in their heads and, and really deliver something that they're, they're expecting. And, and I kind of think that you're probably all pretty good at that, you know, and, and you don't articulate that. And I can't really write that down because HR doesn't value that, but I do, you know. So here's a couple more. Um, integrity, setting high expectations for yourself. A question? Yes. Right. You've created these competencies. These competencies are sort of wholly cross accepted competencies. Right. So the question is whether um, whether these are wholly cross set competencies, um, and they're not. No. I uh, these I came up with. They're they were my my groups of what's important to me. And I actually I just I just sat on my couch one night and just wrote down things that were important. And then I thought, okay, how am I going to categorize these? And and I had I think there's 58 here or 59. And um, I started off with a lot more than that. And I had to boil down what was important to me to make it a little bit more manageable. But um, no, and that was the re part of the reason I had to have the disclaimer. There might be something missing. Um, but I think that anybody could take a group of competencies and things that are specific to their staff and do something very similar. And um, so I don't know. Um, in the hiring process, um, we, I don't know if everybody works this way, but a lot of our interviews are half day long interviews. You have to interview with m way more people than you should. Um, and in doing so, we, one of the first things that we look for is, is fit. Um, and what I do, I give them a test. I, I actually give them 45 minutes and some pencil and some paper and in a, a quiz, and it's a, a quiz that I use to evaluate um, aptitude for learning SQL. And so I give them a couple of different spreadsheets, and I ask them some questions, and it's essentially just sorting and filtering a, a group of data and merging them together. And if they say that they have SQL experience, I ask them to write a SQL statement, and just by hand. And um, we weed out people, <laughs> we weed out liars very quickly. Um, and, um, but some of these things, you know, we just talk about it. It's, 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 we come up with, you know, 10 questions that we're going to ask somebody, but a lot of these things are implied by the questions that we ask. Um, uh, the, okay, so the management and the business analysis, I said, were kind of optional. Um, the business analysis, I love this one, is assertive without being aggressive. That's kind of hard to do, especially when you get emotional about what you're doing, you know, that you, oh, you just want them to help you help them, but you want them to love while you're helping them. <laughs> so, um, so that's one of the things that we evaluate there. But there's a whole, a whole list there. That's why I distributed it there. And here's an image of it. I just didn't want to make you squint or have binoculars to look up there. So my approach is um, to rate each competency. And, and that's what I was saying before, that good is good. Good is great. Um, so improvement opportunity is not great. Um, but strong is really great. So I rate, I'll go through and I'll rate each competency. And then in the, um, 
and then I'll comment, I'll provide comments for each one, and then that will translate to their top accomplishments and opportunities for improvement. So um, here's the thing, and who was, who was talking about this? The fellow from Scotland from Click. Was, was anybody in that session? Okay. For those of you that weren't in the session, he, he showed a picture of uh, a guy that was clearly on some sort of boat, and he was looking seasick, and he was hanging over the edge, and he said, how was your breakfast? And then he asked, he, the next image that he showed was an image of a really attractive woman, and she seemed friendly and engaging, and he said, how was your breakfast? And he talked about the difference in responses based on what the image was when you're asked the question, and that our environment is constantly influencing our decision making and our, the, answer, the way we answer a question. So when I'm evaluating somebody, how do I make sure I'm completely neutral? What, what if I'm in a really great mood and I'm like, she's wonderful and I love her and XO, XO, XO. Um, or if I'm in a crappy mood and, and something, I've just been delivered some bad news or, um, or I have a headache and I just want to get it done. Um, the way I handle that is I break it up into different groups. So different time, I, I try to put a week. I, I spend admittedly probably more time doing this, but that's why I was saying earlier that I think they're worth it. Um, I will go through my ratings and I'll do it when I, I have 10 minutes, so I'll pick it up and I'll rate three or four people or three or four competencies. And you know, I have, I have a meeting in, in three minutes. Well, I have time to just hit a couple ratings. And I run through my ratings, either all at one time or just when I have breaks in the day. And then I let it sit for a week. And then I come back. And by coming back and revisiting those ratings, I just kind of look through and see if, um, see if I agree with myself from the previous week. So the other handout that you have is, um, is how I, how I the form that I actually use. And you can see that there's an asterisk there that says it denotes a deviation from standard expectations. So that's what I was saying earlier. If someone has an improvement opportunity, but they only started a, a week ago, I would expect them to have plenty of improvement opportunities. So a lot, there would be a, a check mark in where they fit relative to what the performance expectations are for the position, but then an asterisk would mean that um, they're really right where they should be given their experience. So I think that's one of those things that's kind of hard to measure. But um, so I'll go through these columns for every competency and just put a little tick mark in wherever I think they are. And then a week later, I'll go back and review that and check my work and then add a comment or an example or something, um, something that exhibits why I would say, you know, I don't want to just arbitrarily pick a number. I want to explain why it is that they have an opportunity for an improvement or what it is, cite some reason why I think that they are above the expectations. Um, the interesting thing is I think over time, the, you know, your job evolves and the, and the staff that's in the job changes the expectations. So I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody that's got this job, but then the job changes because they've changed the job. Um, and that's the only thing that I haven't really accounted for here, but I think that anecdotally you can tackle that. Um, so here's my competency formula. That 70% of competency evaluation, I break it up, and anything that falls left or right of center will become the top accomplishments or um, opportunities for improvement. And I will already have had those examples. Um, and I'll just put it all into paragraph form and group it by competency area. And um, this is what the finished product looks like. So this is my, my breakdown of what the performance evaluation looks like. So I don't want to be that guy. Um, actually, I think I could get fired for being that guy. Um, but let me tell you how you could do something like this and how, um, how I approach it. So I, if I've got 30 days till the end of the year, I'll start doing my reviews. I can do it six weeks before the end of the year. Um, just going through and, and marking off those um, competency scores. And then um, at the same time, I distribute their self-evaluation questions. And um, once I make all my comments and put them all into top, top strengths and um, opportunities for improvement, 
then I'll read their self-evaluation. And sometimes their evaluation will influence me and I'll say, oh, you know, I thought they were really terrible at this one thing. And then they'll give me an example of why they really weren't and why I'm wrong. And, and that's a little humbling, you know, because I'm right a lot, I think. And um, so I'll read their evaluation and I'll take whatever they have and I'll, and I'll think about um, their perspective and uh, being fair. That's where the being fair comes in. And if I haven't given them credit, um, you know, Everything is supposed to be equal, and it's the only way. The only way to make it equal is to make it have, but look through both lenses and make sure that um, that I'm being fair. Um, so the last part is with that incorporating the self evaluation feedback is listing out the opportunities for me to support them. Um, one of my staff people just said, "Can we just have like a monthly meeting of ideas?" And that was really hard because she's got really good ideas. And, um, but our job is to satisfy the ideas of everybody else. So we kind of met in the middle. And, and we, we sometimes talk about things that are important to her versus things that are important to the rest of the team and the people that pay us to do our job. Um, but it, it, was, it was hard to hear that I wasn't already doing that. And it, my boss evaluates me. And he'll pat me on the back and say, you're being a good manager. And I don't really know what that means. You know, my kids are all, I parent them differently. And my staff, I manage them differently. And the only way I know how to manage them well is by working directly with them. Um, so if this, I don't know if how much, if this is interesting to you or if this is something that you would like to be able to do, but with Holy Cross's evaluation approach, I could actually take these competencies, write a couple paragraphs, and f force it into their um, format. And it would still touch on the basic premise without having to change the whole way, the whole delivery of the evaluation. Um, I just wanted to make sure that in all this data that we're talking about, which is the, the foundation for all the work we do, just don't lose your people. You know, especially if you've got good people. If you've got people that can turn over, then you can spend a little less time on that or try to rehabilitate them. But, um, but when you have, I mean, you know, you're, everybody around here seems to be paying attention to other people and, um, and, and how to do our jobs better and how to get, you know, good people stick together. I don't know how many people used to say, okay, those three work together here, now they work together here. And, and, in, in like six months, they're going to work together there. Um, good people stick together. And um, if you have good people, you have to invest the time. Um, so I have super glue. And you could have any kind of that glue. But maybe if you gave them a good performance evaluation, a good thorough one, maybe you'd have super glue too. That's all. Does anybody have any questions? Hi. Um, what do you do when the employee on their self-evaluation rates themselves super high? I mean, they, I know how I rate them, and I know what, where I see them, but for whatever reason, they are giving themselves the exceeds expectations on every single competency. OK, so the question is what you do when your um, employee rates themselves on their um, self-evaluation as being exceedingly high, more, more so than you would rate them. Um, and, that, and that happens to me. Um, that's when you have to have a, um, a very candid discussion about what, if they, if they think they are rating really high, they don't understand what your expectations are. You know, so I think then rolling out the expectations and being more specific and having that conversation about the reconciliation process of where they think they are and where you think they are. And sometimes it's this way, and, and I've, I've had the opposite too, where they're just self-loathing and they're just, sometimes they're just looking for you to just say, you're a lot better than, I, than you think, I think you're better than you think I am. And sometimes they're just baiting you and looking for that. But it, either way, you really want to be on the same page about where they should be and um, where you think they are and where they think they are. So. Hopefully, you only have to have that conversation with that person once. 
but um, it, they respect it. You know, they respect it when you, when you call a spade a spade. It hurts a little bit, but then they understand. And then the next time you give them an evaluation, they know exactly what they have to do to meet the expectations. And, and when they, if they think on that scale of A, B, C, D, E, that's part of our rehabilitation process that we just had to go through because for eight years, I had one staff member that had received an exceeds expectation and we, had, we start, started giving her meet expectations. And it was really, really hard to change the expectation of her expectations, you know? And, um, and she, she felt like a failure. And, it, and it, was, it took a lot of conversations about that good is good. And that good, good's OK. Um, good gets the job done. So that's how I'd answer that. Carolyn? No, so you know what? It's funny. I thought I had. So this is this is what I t typically ask, okay. and and they can decide to go in as in depth as they want, or you know the the more detail they provide, the it adds a little bit more time, but it's almost like you know those Law and Order shows when they bring in people and they. They sit them down, they just get them talking. Sometimes, I, you know, I think, I'm an, I, I think I have this open door policy and I think people think they can come in and talk to me anytime and they can, but there's stuff that they hold back. And so giving them that one time to really say, hey, did you notice that I did this? Because he never really said anything about that. Um, but it's, an, it's a nice way to make sure that you don't, that they are crossing my T's and dotting my I's for me by doing this. I think that, so the question is how you, would you take the lead in getting your, I, I think, let me know if I'm. Work with someone that is very hands off, that kind of would, seems like they prefer not. Prefer not to do any, manager. right, right. So if you're looking for ways to get um, your manager on board with giving you a more thorough evaluation so that you understand where you sit, I think um, asking more questions about what his or her expectations are. Um, You'll do, you can get 75 to 80% of the way there in, in really doing your own evaluation if you know what the expectations are. You won't know, um, sometimes you'll know if you've met them. You know, if, if they're pretty concrete, you'll know if you've met them. If they're the feeling kind of expectations, you won't, you can't get in his or her head so easily. But I think even t just talking about the expectations and where you're sitting, I think is a good start. Alex? Uh, so Alex asked if I have a mechanism for tracking what I care about. It's, it's as simple as having a notebook, but I use Evernote. Evernote goes with me everywhere. Um, who, see, I've already forgotten. Who was talking uh, this week about, oh, Ken Jennings. Yeah, like the, the real smart guy, right? So he was talking about um, if you don't exercise a por portion of your brain with regards to mapping that it, um, it, you'll, you'll see that part of the brain atrophy, right? So my memory is atrophying in advance of me not remembering things. So I write everything in Evernote. And um, you know, if somebody comes in and has, we have a, a difficult conversation, I'll put that conversation in Evernote. And then I can look back on it. Um, you know, when there's something that's particularly challenging, I have a hard time remembering whether if in some ways it feels like it was just yesterday and in some ways it feels like it was so long ago and so in terms of being able to re um, remember exactly the sequence of events and how long ago something happened um, I'll put it in Evernote and I'll put it in with a date and I have a tagging system and then when I go to do the evaluation you know I'll say oh so and so came in and, and they were raving about um, I had somebody come in last week and rave about one of my people's performance and and they did the what was frustrating is they didn't know how great she was they'd never recognized that and they went out of their way to come and tell me that and I'm like well, of course 
it's of course she's great, she's super glue, you know? And, um, and so I just kind of wrote that down. I had the conversation with my staff and said, you know, you just got this unsolicited attaboy from somebody down the hall, and, and that'll have to go into her review because because it ought to, you know? It's fine if you're asking people. The whole three, the concept of a 360 valuation I think is great. It's just nobody has time to do all of that. And this is, this is the unsolicited feedback, positive and negative, that I get from my staff is the way that I fill in some of those gaps. I was just going to add to that. I just send myself an email and stick it in a folder. That puts the date and time and everything. And then you can look back in your email and see. Yeah. Hi. You know, I think you could start, if you, if you don't have a formal review process, you could start by handing out some expectations and just saying, hey, you know, it's occurred to me that I want to start tracking this, and I think it would help both of us if we started tracking this. So here's a list of things that I want to talk about. Can we make an appointment for four months from now and talk about some of these things? Um, I think it's an, an, if you say to somebody, I want to talk about how you've done for the last year, and they're not aware that you were even paying attention, they're going to walk in the room and their guard's already going to be up. But if you, set, if you set the stage, if you set your expectations for them, you know, nine out of ten times they're going to walk in, they're going to know exactly what you're going to say because they will have paid attention to some of those things. Hi. Well, so this would, I'm not in HR, but I have, I have opinions. I can give you my opinion on how, so the question was, um, she has someone who's a serial high performer, and her organization isn't supporting the advancement of that person to a higher um, position, right? So I have, um, we're, we're lo our org chart is pretty locked down, and I have a high performer myself, and um, uh, she didn't have, um, she was one of the ones that didn't have the manager competencies on her um, evaluation and I said, you know, I, I need you to have a next step, and I, and, and I want to know what you want to do more of, and um, and I, don't, I can't change the org chart and give you people, but we do have students that work for us, and I manage the students, and I said, would you like to take on some, you know, you can add things to your resume, I can't give her any more um, compensation for it, but I could certainly add that to her resume, and she could start managing the students, and then I could help coach her in her in developing her own managerial style and um, and so that's what we've done and it's given her at least a little bit more responsibility things to add to her resume but you know unless I move on she she'll move on you know so in the end it's going to be me or her my hope is that I, I train her to replace me and then whoever wants to leave first can go <laughs> you know but um, I think you have to you have to almost love them out of your organization. And, and that part of where I work, I work because of the people I work with. And, and I, I, that's hard to replace. You know, I mean, being OK with getting up and leaving your family every day and going to work, um, that, that's pretty good. If you're, if you're happy to be where you are, that's, that's good. So if she's happy, just find out what other th competencies she'd like to absorb and, and put it on her. You know, you can change her job if only a little bit, to have different kinds of responsibility and things that would actually bolster her resume over time and make her a candidate. If you, if you can't jump to here where she's at right now, maybe she can make a leap over that if you give her the skill set that she needs to be qualified for the next, what would be the most natural next step. Look out. 
outside of your organization to sister or other sister organizations and see what kind of opportunities lie therein, and then put a good word into this individual and help try to get them promoted over to a different department where they might have a commensurate skill set that fits. Yeah, I think that's a good. You lose. Like you said, somebody you really value, but what's it about at the end of the day? Is it about I need that person, or is it about I want to do what's best for that individual's career? Right, right. I, I think the hardest thing, the hardest thing to ask somebody, and I hate asking them this, is where do you see yourself in five years? You know, I mean, it's such a cliche thing to say, but if you say where do you see yourself in five years, most times you don't want to hear that because if the answer is oh, not here, that it hurts. It's personal, you know. Um, I think it's a tough question to ask, but I think it's something you ask, and, and you, you tell them that the door's open if they want to go. And th they're going to go anyway when it's time, but um, if they really enjoy being there, that's going to be the difference between making that immediate step and running for the hills or sticking around maybe being paid a little less than they should be and, and gaining a little more experience. So I don't know where we are on time. I think we're, we're, we're there. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, thanks. I've really enjoyed this week with you all. Thank you.